good afternoon. I'm Jay Kalicharan, the chairperson of the KZN Center of the South African Institute of Electrical Engineers. I extend a warm welcome to our esteemed presenter, Rob Stevens, officials and members of the South African Institute of Electrical Engineers and all our attendees. I hope you are all taking care and keeping safe during this pandemic while continuing, continuing to serve the industry. Just a few considerations for our attendees. You are reminded to ensure that the, that the volume is turned up on your device. Ensure you have a stable internet connection. This will ensure the streaming and audio will run smoothly. Attendees can ask questions via the questions panel located within the GoToWebinar control panel. By default, the control panel is located on the right-hand side of your screen. The chat function is reserved for organizers and panelists to communicate with attendees. Attendees will not be able to chat with each other. However, you are encouraged to ask questions. A recording of the presentation will be made available on the SAIWE YouTube channel, which is SAIWE TV. The recording will also be made available on the SAIWE website under the events drop down menu in the section past events and webinars. This page is updated regularly, so ensure you check back as often as possible for new uploads and subscribe to our YouTube channel for more uploads. A certificate of attendance will be issued a few weeks after this webinar, once we have received the CPD validation number for this webinar from the Engineering Council of South Africa. A little about our presenter, Dr. Rob Steven. Dr. Rob Steven was born in Johannesburg, South Africa. He holds a BSc, MSc, and an MBA degree, as well as a PhD in overhead line design. Rob worked for ESKIM as a master specialist in the technology group, which is responsible for the distribution and transmission technologies of all voltages, both AC and DC. He was also responsible for the smart grid strategy at ESKIM. He retired from ESKIM at the end of January, 2020. Rob is past chairperson of CGRAY study committee B2 on overhead lines. At CGRAY, he held the post of special reporter and working group chairperson. He has authored over 100 technical papers. Rob was elected international president of CGRE in 2016. He is a fellow of the South African Institute of Electrical Engineers, a past chairperson of the Institute's KZN Center, and was the recipient of the President's Award in 2016. The topic for presentation is optimization of overhead line design. This webinar will cover the parameters for AC and DC lines, line configurations, electrical and mechanical aspects of lines, the results of a survey of line cost compared to com conductor cost, which was conducted in 1992, determining the best set of designs for AC and DC applications. Optimization of overhead line design was published as a technical brochure number 638 in 2015, and is available from the EC Gray sites. Dr. Stevens, it's over to you. Uh, thank you very much. I'll, um, I'll just, in, uh, to the, uh, thank you, Jay, for all the introductions. Uh, just to indicate that the uh, technical brochure 638 deals with all what is covered uh, in this tutorial, and that's for free download, whether you're a C Gray member or not, you just have to register on the EC Gray site and you can download the, um, the, 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 the brochure. I'll just switch off the webcam to save um, some uh, uh, bandwidth uh, and continue with the audio. <laughs> just going through what, we, well, what the tutorial will cover, we're going to do AC and DC line design here. At the end of it, you should get an overview of the uh, characteristics of the particular um, of line design and uh, understand the interactions between the uh, design of the line and the particular electrical characteristics. So what we're going to do is do the electrical, then the mechanical, 
thermal rating, which was covered in a previous webinar about a few weeks ago. Um, and then to look at how we interact the function of the line with the planner's requirements, uh, how we develop an objective indicator, in fact, to determine uh, which group of line designs we need to actually take forward to the detailed design stage. And then we'll do something similar for the DC line design. Thermal rating is, 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 is fairly common between the two, as is mechanical characteristics and uh, planner's requirements. So really what we're looking at in DC line is the electrical characteristics and the objective indicator. Then we will cover a, <clears throat> an example of cost of lines, which is covered from a survey that was done globally for um, the TB638, and then go on to some examples. So the first uh, section that we're going to deal with is AC line design. And I would suggest if you have questions, please send them through. Uh, there will be, uh, uh, we'll answer questions at the end of each section. So the first thing that you need to understand is when you're looking at power line design is that you, a power line is not a, a group of um, conductors and, uh, and, and towers. It is a single device which is used to transmit power over long distances. And it's similar in a device to a transformer, although it is open to the to ambient conditions. And it's important to view a, um, a, a power line as a single device, because if you look at it as a section of, of, of towers, uh, you tend to miss the interaction between the, the conductors, the towers, the phase spacings, and so on. The other beautiful thing about a line is that it can be tailor-made to meet planners' requirements. Um, so you can get the impedance required, you can get the power transfer required, and so on. And this is really what the optimization of, uh, of, of uh, transmission lines is dealing with. Then, of course, we have load flow, which depends on the resistance, inductance, and susceptance values uh, of the particular line. Having a look at a simplified line model, you get uh, in the uh, series com leg, you get a resistance and inductance. And in the capacitive leg, in, in, in the shunt leg, you get a capacitance to ground. So really what we're looking at when you optimize the line is to try and reduce the series leg because this really inhibits, inhibits your power flow and increase your, your capacitance, which will then increase your receiving voltage. Obviously, you don't want this to be too high because then this goes too high and you have to have a reactance uh, in the network. But basically, in theory, you want to try and reduce this and increase this. Let's have a look at how we then uh, maximize the power transfer. <laughs> what they look at then is a thing called a surge impedance. And uh, really, the surge impedance loading, SIL, is given by this formula down here, the VLL, V line, face to face over the uh, ZS, and ZS is root L over C. So, really, what you want to try and do is reduce this, so increase C, reduce L. L is a series of inductance, and C is a shunt capacitance. So, you reduce L and increase C to maximize transfer. Determining how to determine Rx and B, which will then link to L and L, C, and R, we we'll need to then look at what, what makes up a resistance of a particular conductor. And really, <laughs> the resistance is dependent on the construction of the conductor material and line length, of course. The conductor resistance is dependent on the lay ratio, that's how, tight, how tightly the conductor is wound. And then, of course, whether it's an ACSR, a triple AC, or any other kind of conductor. Then we're also looking in at the number of layers, diameter of strands, and so on, which will affect the um, resistance. Also, to uh, looking at the resistance, the temperature of the conductor, higher the temperature, higher the resistance. And uh, there's, a, there's a, a formula which was covered in the last tutorial on that. Then we also dealt with this in the last uh, tutorial or webinar. Current and frequency, you get a transformer effect and eddy currents with the swirling of the current around the steel core, which increases heat within the steel core, which will increase the resistance of the particular conductor. 
And this is all covered in um, a Seagrave brochure on AC resistance, uh, whereby you can actually calculate the uh, AC resistance of a conductor relating to um, frequency and current. Now, um, normally in the past, the frequency was considered uh, quite important and that increases the resistance by about 2%. But if you look at the um, certain conductors, you'll find that the current, in fact, is a bigger increase in, uh, in, in, in resistance than the frequency effect. And especially in single layer conductors, these are your layers used on MV lines. So your hair, mink, uh, this is a penguin. Um, you can actually get the, uh, looking at the, um, the, the, the current, uh, down the conductor as a function of the resistance AC to DC resistance. So in other words, if there was no um, no AC resistance increase or increase due to current, that would be one. Uh, the resistance here, you can see, goes up to around 12%. Why it goes down again is because the steel core is saturated. Now that's a single core conductor. So when you're looking at um, very high current densities, uh, on MV lines or lines with hair conductor, for example, uh, you need to be careful uh, of your volt drops when you are running at around three amps per square mil. Normally, economically, we run down in this area, which is about one amp per square mil or less. So it won't really affect the, um, the, the, the particular resistance. Now, if we look at a 1954-19, uh, which is similar to a dinosaur, or in this case, a falcon conductor, a three-layer conductor, you'll find that the the impact is not as great because of the fact that the uh, the the current goes is is cancelled by uh, the 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 current swirling in different directions in each layer. So you'll get a um, a current going in one direction in the first layer, in the second layer it's going in the other direction, so it cancels it, and in the third layer it goes in the same as the first layer. So you'll you'll then find that there is a slight increase. And that goes up to around 10%, but again, it's around about, if you're looking here at around about four amps uh, per square mil. That's where you need to start worrying about it. And you can get those kind of currents if you're looking at emergency um, uh, lines, li lines under emergency conditions. The double layer uh, conductor, because of the cancelling effect, almost has no variation with current. And this is only with ACSR conductors, not with uh, 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 AAA, C, A car or, or fiber cores. Now we've dealt with resistance. Let's look here at, at um, inductance. And inductance is a function of the geometric mean radius and geometric mean distance. Basically, you need to understand that the larger the bundle radius and the closer the face spacing will give you a lower L. Now let's look at determination of C. Basically, the, what you need to understand with capacitance, to increase capacitance, keep phases closer together. So what we have with, L, with resistance, you can use larger conductors, you can um, uh, use uh, more aluminium per phase, that's either in bundle configuration or large conductors. And then for L, you just keep the phases together, and for C, you keep the phases together. So it, it looks quite simple, have a compact line, with large conductors and you won't have a problem. So in summary, SIL, L and C can be varied by varying phase spacing, closer is better, increasing bundle size, larger is better, and resistance can be improved by varying low ratios per layer. You can actually remove the, um, the uh, function of resistance due to current by um, varying the low ratio, but it's not really practical. As we said, you can use different materials and you can use homogeneous conductors. Now we get into the next problem. What happens when we bring our phases closer together? The problem is that you start hitting corona limitations. And what's the problem with corona? It's not really losses on AC lines. Um, it's more this audible noise that you can get under certain weather conditions. And it's very difficult to mitigate. Uh, so it's a, it's desirable to avoid uh, to avoid a corona inception. Now let's see what improves corona. Smaller bundle radius will reduce corona up to a point, and then it increases again. 
wider phase spacing is better and more subconductor bundles is better. Now there we get the wider phase spacing, which means that your L and C is now going to go in the wrong direction if you're going to meet the corona limitations. Um, so what we need to try and do then is you have to get some kind of a, um, a, a balance and optimize between the two so that you meet your corona limitations as well as have an optimal L and C values. Now we look at the mechanical characteristics of AC line design. When you're looking at mechanical characteristics, wind load is a major consideration. And what does it state there? Less conductors in the bundle, the better. Now, when we looked at the um, looked at Corona, it said more conductors in the bundle is better. Also, less UTS is better. You get lighter strain towers, and you can use higher tension to increase the height, so you can use lower towers, so you can get a saving with with conductors with lower use. In other words, conductors that are not that strong, um, as long as you can manage the um, ice and wind loading. Then, of course, if you increase the tension to increase your height and reduce your tower height to eat vibration problems. So vibration, this is aeolian vibration, is a function of tension. And you need to design to the recommended tension to mass ratio. Normally, we use around 1450. But on the uh, polymer cord conductors, you might go up to around over three to 4,000 um, due to the very light uh, mass per unit length. Now, the, um, the smaller bundle sizes, twin or triple, uh, need more care in vibration damping design. The reason is that the, uh, if you're looking at a spacer damper uh, with um, many subconductors in the bundle, you'll find that the, uh, the, the, that the actual frame has a lot of inertia. So you can actually get a lot of damping out of the, uh, con out of the conductor, a lot of energy out of the conductor into the spacer damper. Um, but on twin and triple, it's very difficult to do that. So twin spacer dampers, in fact, are not very common. You can actually get them, um, but it's sometimes better to use uh, stock bridge dampers on either end and then use spacers rather than spacer dampers. But you need to you need uh, quite a bit of care if you're looking at small uh, bundle sizes, which actually would help your wind load. The other thing you need to take into account, of course, is um, galloping. Uh, and now galloping is something which comes into where you have uh, ice on conductors. It forms an aerofoil and then causes the conductor to move uh, in um, a very large arc, which can actually destroy a tower in a couple of days. So this is very serious. And it, the phase configuration um, is quite important so that you don't have phases one above the other in a double circuit line. And that's why you'll see some lines uh, where the center phase is actually further out than the top two for top phase and bottom phase. That's due to galloping mitigation. Then you could also use pendulum dampers, which uh, avoid the formation of the aerofoil, as well as interface spaces, um, which are quite important to, to just hold the, um, the, the, the phases away from each other so that they don't cause spark over. Looking then at the tower top geometry, um, and that applies to conventional towers with metal surround center face. In other words, if you've got a cross rope tower um, where all the three phases are in the same window, you don't really have a tower top geometry issue. Uh, but if you've got normal conventional towers with a center phase going through the middle of the tower and the other two phases on, on, the, uh, on, on the outside, you then need to take into account your insulation coordination between the center phase and the, the tower window. So the interaction between the phases as well as the shielding angle for the conductors needs to be carefully designed to ensure optimal insulation coordination. So you need to have, ensure that you have a um, angle of 30 degrees or less cover for your um, phase from your, from your uh, shielding angle and, and uh, preferably a negative angle rather than a positive angle is, is, is a better. Looking then at the AC line design, we're looking at thermal rating. Now, what is the really, as was covered before, the thermal rating is a load at which safety or annealing criteria of the line is met. So that's the safety criteria links to the height above the ground is in line with our OSHACT. The height is determined by voltage and flashover distance. And to calculate the, the thermal rating, we use a heat balance equation, 
where you've got your dual heat, magnetic heating, solar heating, and ionization or, con or corona heating. Now, magnetic heating is normally included in the dual effect, so you get um, one uh, effect there relating to uh, AC to DC ratio. The ionization or corona heating occurs at high wind and high humidity, where the cooling effect is very high. So the 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 corona in fact heating can be ignored because really the we shouldn't be in corona in the first place on the cooling side you've got convective uh, radiative and evaporative cooling against evaporative cooling is um considered uh to be ignored because you, it's, it's it's an incredibly high uh, uh cooling effect when the conductor is wetted but you have to be certain that the entire line uh, is as as wet conductor, which is not always possible to do. So as mentioned before, dual dual and magnetic heating. Dual is dependent on the AC resistance and temperature. Magnetic heating on the current and conductor layers. Solar heating depends on the darkness of the conductor diameter and solar radiation. So that's your P solar is your absorptivity, uh, solar radiation in watts per meter squared. And then the diameter, the bigger the diameter, the higher the solar heating um, of, the, of the conductor. Looking at convective cooling, this is a cooling due to the wind. Um, it's dependent on the conductor diameter, bigger is better. On the wind speed, the temperature difference between the conductor and the, and the ambient temperature, the bigger is better. And then the roughness factor, if you've got a, a smooth conductor, it, it doesn't cool as well as a uh, conductor with very large strands. The other thing, of course, that affects the thermal rating is the templating temperature. And here we can see the variation on turn and zebra, <laughs> um, where you can get increase from, if you go from 50 degrees to 80 degrees, you can almost double your thermal rating. Um, and the, the reason for that is that it just takes a higher temperature to get to the particular object uh, height above ground clearance. So all the templating temperature does is that it lifts the conductor higher above the ground and it then um, allows you more current to flow down before the templating temperature is reached. And in South Africa, we don't go above 80 degrees C uh, really due to the fact that the uncertainty in variation in the um, ambient conditions uh, may cause a conductor to go above 80 degrees C up to 120 or 100 degrees C for a short period of time. That might cause annealing. So unless you have real-time monitoring on the system to, 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 to limit it above that, um, it's not recommended to actually go above uh, 80 degrees C templating. So in summary, if we're looking here at um, what actually affects the um, AC line, we've got surge impedance loading, corona, mechanical loading, and thermal. So if we decrease the phases, as we said, we um, improve, uh, reduce the inductance and improve the capacitance. So that for SIL is good. For corona, it's bad. For mechanical loading, it's good because you don't get the moment uh, on the tower if one of the conductors break. Thermal rating, it doesn't really matter. For large area aluminium areas in other words instead of having a six bundle you've got a four bundle with bigger conductors the surge impedance loading is bad because it likes to have more subconductors in the, in in the, in the bundle the corona is bad because it likes to have uh, more subconductors in the bundle mechanical loading is good because it has less lower wind load and for thermal rating it's bad because you you actually get um far better cooling per conductor if you have more in the bundle. So a quad bundle with the same aluminum area as a twin bundle will actually give you a higher thermal rating, even though it's the same aluminum area. For diameter, if you're reducing the bundle diameter, the SIL is, is good up to a point. So sorry, here we're increasing the dumb di bundle diameter. SIL is good, corona is bad. Um, as we said, because you, you, you need to actually bring the, um, reduce the, the, uh, the, the, the bundle diameter to improve your corona performance. So the SIL is good, and you can find that in the examples in 
Brazil that they use very large bundles, one meter between or 1.2 meters between subconductors. Uh, and that gives you a very good or called a high SIL line. Um, the mechanical loading, again, uh, bad, although the uh, vibration protection is quite good. Um, but the mechanical loading is, is, is bad due to the, again, the large bundle uh, management and, and the wind uh, relating to that and broken phase con considerations. For thermal rating, it's neutral. If you have a high steel content conductor, uh, the SIL is, is neutral, corona is neutral, mechanical loading bad due to the um, high um, due to the uh, high uh, uh, um, uh, tension tend to UTS and so you need uh, larger um, strain towers. Thermal rating is good because you get a lower rate of sag per degree C. So that's really how you can see that there is no one line which has got all green. And this is a problem because you now need, you've got two greens here, so maybe decrease the phase spacing. That might be quite good um, if you've got a, uh, and this is why compact lines are so popular. But it's bad for corona, so you need to actually try and um, manage the corona within the compact line design. Now we've mentioned how to design the particular line. Let's have a look now at what the uh, the plan is what they actually require so that you can actually tailor make the line to suit their requirements. What the planning people normally need to, to, to specify is the load transfer requirements. How much load do I need to push down this particular line? And this is becoming more and more difficult to determine with um, renewable generation and so on. Um, but that you need to know more or less what your uh, what your maximum normal and emergency load is going to be. You also need to have an idea of the daily and annual load flow. Is it a winter peak, summer peak? Uh, is it early morning, um, midday? Well, what is it going to be? When are we going to hit that big load? And uh, the reason for that is that you can tailor make your, your thermal rating correctly. So if it's winter and you've got a, a a really cold um, ambient condition when you hit your high load, you can in fact uh, use uh, either real-time monitoring or high temperature, temperature and you can actually um, meet that particular uh, thermal rating for that particular um, uh, season. Then you need to also know what your Rx and B parameters are because planners when they do the load flows, they will assume certain Rx and B parameters to do the load flow. You need to understand what those are and if there's a high and a low. So in parallel lines, you might have a, um, a request on low Rx and B values because you don't want the power to go all down the one leg and not down the other leg. You also need to understand that what, what happens with the voltage at the receiving end. Do you need to have compensation if you have an SIL that is too high? Um, you also need to understand the voltage, of course. Is it uh, 400 for or 275, we need to know the length, start and end points, and then what reliability requirements there are. And this is important to understand that the planners need to explain the importance of this line in the network so that you know whether to design it to, um, to a level two or level three, 500 uh, year return period, uh, 50 year return period or 150 year return period for the mechanical loading. So this is important, the reliability. Just getting on here as to what kind of conductor size and, and, and temperature you can actually design to. Here we've got, if you need a thermal rating of a thousand amps, you can do it in many different ways. You can do it with a conductor that is um, like a normal ACSR conductor. And at this point here, you can get that which is around uh, 70 degrees C. You can meet the thousand amps. But you can also meet it if you use a 400 mil conductor at 100 degrees C, or you could you could use a 200 mil conductor at 200 degrees C. So depending on how on on what your requirements are, and this is why the load profile is important because if it's a flat profile, you want to have the biggest conductor possible so that your load um, your losses are low. If you're using a 200 mil conductor and you're running at a flat profile of a thousand amps continuously, your losses are going to be 
far higher than you would with the 800 mil, um, around about 16 times higher. So this is quite important that you need to understand what the planner really requires in relation to the particular load and when is that load going to occur. Is it one hour per year, one hour per two years? It's only going to happen once in the life of the line, or is it going to be continuous? This is quite. This is very important. You could looking at the different conductors that you can actually start considering. Then there are many, many kinds, and these are just a couple. You can get a thermal resistant conductor. You can get a thermal resistant conductor with an invar core. Invar means it's um, it's uh, invariable to temperature. And you get an extra, which is the X thermal resistant aluminium alloy, which then is around 200 degrees C. Or you could use a gap conductor, which will reduce the knee point of the particular conductor. And you can then use a TEL or ZTEL, or uh, on, on depending on the particular type of uh, aluminium that you wish to use. Uh, or you could use what is quite common in the US as an ACSS conductor which is a steel supported. So this here is entirely annealed. So you can go up to 250 degrees with a conductor, which costs about 20% more than a normal ACSR. And you can use the same hardware. Whereas these others, you need to be careful in using hardware. And the gap is a very complicated conductor to actually join. Looking at this, and this is covered in TB244, which you can also download for free. It gives examples of how to um, how to select a particular conductor type uh, for for various applications, and the example given here is that the original line was designed at this particular sag. Um, two meters was given as a as a buffer, and it still existed. So you got a maximum sag at that point there, which will hit the regulation above ground. And now you need to infect. From your current, you need to, in fact, have around 200 degrees C for your conductor. In other words, it was a small conductor and we need to run it hot. What conductor types do we use? Well, you can see this is where the knee point comes in as being um, very important because if you've got a ZTAC, which is a blue line, you're actually going to hit the um, you're going to hit the maximum sag at around 100. 10 degrees, which is not going to give you your current rating, even though the in invar core kicks in at this point and it goes very flat. After that, that still doesn't help you. The zebra that we would normally use on that particular line, temperature at around 80 degrees, 75 to 80 degrees C. Um, again, you, you wouldn't normally run it above that because of annealing problems uh, and you can't really reach your maximum sag or increase your temperature. So that's a temperature limit. Looking at the ACSS uh, trap wire, um, you, it has a low, a low knee point. And this is due to the fact that the, con that the strands are all annealed and very, very soft. So all the load goes onto the steel core, which then actually um, uh, enables you to have a low knee point, which then gives you at 200, you can then reach the 200 degree C without teaching a maximum sag. Alternatively, if you want a really low knee point, you can use a GZ tech, um, which is this green line, which has no knee point. And that goes purely on the steel core. So this is a steel core um, uh, curve here, and you can get it well within the SAG requirements. So although the uh, ZTAC IR is, an, is, a high, is a fairly complicated, uh, high temperature, low SAG conductor, it might not suit your needs. So you need to actually analyze each case in point as to when to use a particular um, high temperature conductor and when not to. Looking at the next uh, line, if you're looking at it, you look at the insulator selection. So the location of the conductor bundle determined to meet the insulation coordination requirements, you need to determine that. In other words, which where, where's a point in the tower window that the conductor, uh, the bundle needs to be uh, positioned. You need to understand insulator creepage, dry arcing distance, basic insulation level, and this it depends on the pollution levels in the particular line route. And there are books around this as to how to 
do that and determine what pollution levels relate to which creepage um, and how you actually design that and then what specifications do you particularly use uh, to ensure that your um, that that your insulator is is in fact the correct one now your insulator configuration depends on your tower selection um, and you might wish to use a v string or an i string or you might want to use an inverted y or a y string if you want uh, a large amount of insulation but a very short overall insulator string uh, length um, which is normally used to increase height above ground um, the material of the conductor depends on pollution of the insulator depends on pollution vandalism we normally use composites and then maintenance and polluted areas we normally use composites most of them these days are all silicon composites hardware depends on materials um, so corona rings for composite live line requirements Live line requirements are very important for compact lines, um, whether you need special hardware or special tools for the um, phase uh, for the phase configurations um, that you have chosen. For cross rope towers, the I string permits less pollution accretion, especially from birds. If you're using V strings uh, and you find bird excretion can actually gather in the in the apex of the V, uh, causing then flashovers. Or pollution flash pollution on the string and then flash overs to the tower the other thing you need to consider is lightning considerations now the shield angle determines depending on the against on the tower type this particular tower here um, which is a, a, an inverted delta uh, gives you a very good lightning protection due to the negative angle of the shield shield wire to the particular phase um, so that's something that you would would like to consider. Normally, we'd have a phase out here, which means you've got a positive angle. So if you can have a narrow negative angle, you can actually get a very good um, uh, lightning performance. You need to look at, at the tower's footing. You need to be determined to reduce on the line. You can use crow's foot, buried earth wire, or a bentonite mix to actually uh, reduce the footing resistance. And the thing about these large towers with the very large footprints, uh, with the guys, um, is that is that you get a very good earth uh, earth mat generated, so you can get a very low uh, resistance with these kind of towers. No towers with low. That's what I said. With large footprints, give lower footing resistance, so that the cross rope suspensions give you very good results. And if tower footing resistance is still high, you can use line surge resistors installed on certain towers uh, then a shield or earth wires are now often opgw so you need to look at the fault current in the particular earth wire uh, and whether you need in fact to to have a different kind of earth wire uh, to take current away from the opgw so that's also something to consider um, richard at that point um, we can uh, now look at the uh, any, if there are any questions Sorry, so um, thank you, Dr. Stephen. Just uh, there is a question section. If you could uh, type some questions at the moment, if you would like to ask, um, we have we are breaking the uh, tutorial um, just to to give some a chance for those who might want to ask questions. Um, so we'll just give you one or two minutes. Uh, Dr. Stephen, just a question from our side while we're waiting. Um, the, have you had a look at any use of superconductors at all? I remember studying it 20 years ago at, at university and I, I don't see much application of it yet. Um, have you been exposed to any of that? You mean superconductors being uh, very cold? The, yes. Uh, yes. Think, yeah, no, obviously not on lines. There is. There are superconductors uh, lines being used uh, overseas. Uh, it's becoming more popular, especially in congested areas, but that's more superconducting cables. Um, yes, yes. We use superconductors to um, look at, uh, at, at superconducting magnetic energy storage for dip mitigation, uh, the SMES uh, systems, as well as, um, uh, so in other words, it's used for uh, 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 power factor or, or power quality correction uh, rather than power transmission 
but in the in 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 Chicago they're using a they're looking at a kilometer superconducting cable, uh, so uh, so that if the other um, uh, circuits are damaged, they can actually put most of the power down a superconducting cable, um, rather which is which can fit into a very narrow uh, servitude. So it's a single cable which can take four to five times the normal um, uh, load uh, that other cables would take. So so they're looking at uh, in in that point. Um, but uh, uh, relating to lines and that, no, no, no not at all. Um, okay, so we've got two questions here. Uh, a couple of questions are coming through. Um, Thea Sitar uh, asks, how do we find the right balance between low load and high voltage? So 220 kV uh, overhead line with a load of only 150 megawatts, for example. Typically a single conductor would be suitable, but I'm assuming corona would be an issue. What do you need to consider? Okay, yeah, it is a problem, especially in our country with um, a high altitude, low loads, and uh, long distances. So you normally use a uh, higher voltage, uh, but a very low load, which means you then got to, um, you could have a 400 kV with a, with 800 megawatts or 500 megawatts or something, which means that you can actually get by with very, very small conductors, which then hit your corona problems. Now, 220, you can actually uh, get by on a single conductor, but it's got to be a big conductor. So it's got to be a 35 mil uh, at least, um, uh, which uh, then you, 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 you would use that so that you, your mechanical loading is low, but you can use um, a, a twin bundle, say a, you know, a twin turn or something like that on a 220, 275 kV line uh, for that particular uh, kind of um, uh, issue. But the, the Corona is a big issue. And, in our country here as well, because of our high altitudes, most of our load is at 1,800 meters or 1,500 meters. Uh, and Corona is, is very uh, susceptible uh, at high altitude. Um, so that, that also forces us to go to more bundle configurations above 165 kV. Okay, thank you. Um, we've got a couple of other questions here quickly. Let me just, they're coming through fast and furious. Um, from David Levin, the TM tension mass uh, ratio, what are the units? Um, is, it, is it tension in newtons or kgf? Uh, it's, it's, no, no, it's newtons and uh, mass is, is, um, is, is uh, a meter, uh, a kilogram, meter length. Uh, sorry, newtons per meter, yeah. The, uh, the, 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 the ratio is in meters. So you're looking at a 1450 meter. So it doesn't really matter what your units are for tension or mass, uh, as long as you're looking at meters and we're using about 1450. But there's a excellent brochure, uh, which is also free download from Seagray, which gives you actual graphs as to where you can actually safely use these particular T to M ratios. Um, so I would suggest look at that because it's not only T to M, it's a little bit more than that. It's a, it depends on the span length, the dia the um, the diameter of the conductor and the and the mass and tension. Um, the figure I gave is a ballpark figure, but it might not suit everything. So you need to study that particular um, brochure, which is a vibration for undamped conductors. And and you can then uh, there's also one out on bundle conductors, um, which you can then um, get a get a far better idea of what that ratio is. Hundred percent. Thank you. Karen Fosley, yeah, just wants to know when you come to the Cape to visit some of the wine farms. I think you've obviously done some work there. Um, <laughs> it's possible. <laughs> yes. Um, how do you work out the spacing between bundled conductors from Lucy Sanguini? Uh, the, 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 it, I guess you mean, you mean the subconductor uh, spacings? Yes. Normally the yes. subconductor spacings are around um, between 380 and 450 mil. Um, but you need to make sure that the subconductor spacing uh, is more than 15 times the diameter of the conductor. Otherwise, you're going to start getting subspan oscillation problems. So you need to make it a little bit more, more than that. So aim for about 15 to 20 times the diameter of the actual um, uh, uh, conductor that you're actually using. Uh, in that, if the conductor is a leeward, which it normally is in a square con uh, configuration. So that, that's how you determine that. 
Okay, um, here's one I'm going to answer myself. Ananda Subisi wants to know if the session is available. And yes, it will be published on the South African Institute of Electrical Engineers website. All of these sessions are recorded and they are available. Um, and then a question here from Kosi Nati Nglela. Uh, do we have cases of corona on MV? I think, do you want to answer that? Uh, it's very rare. You, you, you almost don't. You might start getting corona issues around um, if you're using steel wire uh, or you're using um, certain of our sewer conductors, you might start getting it if you've got nicks on the conductor. But really, it's not an issue. And the issue that I didn't mention as well is audible noise is a function of the conductor by a diameter. The bigger the diameter, the more the noise. Now, if you're using really, really small conductors, even if you get corona, you almost won't hear it outside the 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 um outside the the right of way so it, it's really not an issue on mv it starts becoming an issue above you can start getting issues around 66 kv but it's mainly 88 kv and above that you'll start running into corona problems and 88 kv it's really on the hair conductor maximum size if you start running uh, 88 kv fox or mink you'll start running into corona problems no problem. Okay, we're going to take the last question and then we're going to continue. The last question is from um, so for you, you're going to have to wait. Um, Lucy uh, Sanguini, um, she's asking, what are the consequences of a sort of mid midline terminated shield wire that doesn't go end to end? Um, I'm assuming she's talking about the issues of backflash and, and things like that. No, um, it, it, can, it, it doesn't normally have an effect if it's in the middle of the line. You would normally ensure that it's properly earthed and so on. Um, if you take the, the, the shield wire off for large sections of line, then you, then you need to really do the um, uh, line insulation coordination analysis again because you might start getting uh, lightning breakthroughs and 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 so on on the particular uh, line. But if you're looking at sort of at a one span or two spans, um, we you we have to reduce the earth wire, um, uh, take the earth wire down for some reason or other. Uh, it's not normally an issue. Uh, and normally we take the earth wire off if you've got crossings, and then you've got the protection of the line that's crossing over the top anyway. So that's not an issue. Yes. Okay. The last question. Um, for now, we are going to ask questions again at the end. Is there any yeah. software available that can optimize or can assist with conductor optimization? Uh, there, the, 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 they are none. The, the, um, the, you, the EPRI have got a TL workstation which includes everything uh, around here. But there, there's this is why I'll come when I come onto the objective indicator as to how to actually uh, optimize the line. Um, because you, if you're looking at line optimization, you'll always find that it's really just tower optimization, tower positioning. In other words, there's a lot like PLS CAD will give you a very good uh, way of templating a line for a particular profile and will give you where to put the right tower at the right spot for the lowest cost. That kind of optimization there is. That's PL, PLS CAD and so on. Um, but if you're looking at uh, if, if you're looking at how to take the function of the line and move that all the way through. To a final line design, it's just too complicated. Uh, there's, there's there's nothing uh, available in a single package for that. Okay, so that is the last question, Dr. Stephen. I'm handing back over to you. Thanks. I'll then uh, switch off my uh, webcam and then start again. Thank you. Okay, now we're getting on to uh, what we call an objective indicator. We've done everything now. We've got all these options. How do we put them all together? So we need to look at an indicator to determine the best design. So you need to combine surge impedance loading, thermal rating, and initial cost and life cycle cost of the line. And these would take into account Corona. In other words, the options that you that you look at, have a look. At, it should all all handle. In other words, Corona should all be dealt with. Magnetic fields should be dealt with, mechanical loading should be dealt with, and so on. In other words, these are all workable options. These are all workable solutions um, that you could now start plugging into some kind of an indicator to try and um, sort out the, uh, the, the the best option. And the first one really is um, that we're looking at is the life cycle cost. So we take the life cycle cost, which covers the determination of optimum aluminium area, cost of maintenance, and cost of losses. 
Now, normally, you'll find the cost of maintenance is minimal over the life of the line. The cost of system losses is, is really where you increase, you, where, where you get a very large um, a, a amount uh, in the life cycle cost. The second factor that you would look at is the thermal rating. So the cost is directly proportional to the thermal rating, higher the rating, higher the initial cost. So therefore, we're looking at a ratio. Say you take a ratio of the initial cost to MVA thermal. So if you've got a very high thermal rating and a very low initial cost, maybe you've got a good line. So maybe the lower the ratio, the better. Then the third one is surge impedance loading. The higher the surge impedance loading, uh, the higher the initial cost normally. Um, therefore, a ratio is normally also required. So initial cost to high to MVA SAL. So the higher the SAL, lower initial cost, better the ratio, better the, the design. Then you need to combine the all of them together. Now you can't add apples and pears. So what <laughs> we've proposed is that you actually get a score for each of the rate, each of the values that you've got. So life cycle uh, cost, you'll get a particular uh, score out of ten uh, for the uh, for the thermal rating to MVA SIL. You'd get a a score out of ten, and as for the um, thermal rating one. Uh, and then you've got weighting factors which add up to one. So the um, so the what we're calling as appropriate technology index, uh, you would have different scores here, which are now non uh, don't have any units, and you can add all it together, and you can get a score for that particular design. And what we're saying here is it, it's actually called an objective matrix method, um, and it was used with uh, in human resources area, but the present practice that you take, say you're using quad zebra or using triple turn conductors, give it a three out of 10. Um, and then you determine what you consider to be a really good score. In other words, um, with a life cycle cost of $10 million, I'll make that a 10 out of 10 uh, score. And then you use linear interpolation between the lot and you can actually get, for any value, you can get a score out of 10. So that's really how it's done. Also, what you need to, to look at, um, and this is compliments from ESKIM, line engineering, is the um, is conduct optimization. This is your millions, life cycle cost, and this is a range mean value of, of load that you could have uh, expected on the line. And these are the conductors that you're looking at. Um, and you what you would find is that the lower conductor here, the one that gives you the lowest cost in that area, is highlighted. So you're looking at a triple turn, you're looking at a quad kingbird, triple turn, quad turn and triple burst fit. And in this particular case, for this particular mean power transfer, quad kingbird seems to be the best option. Next thing you'd look at really, do you want to use cross rope suspensions? Are you using guide towers? Um, and the cross ropes actually, uh, the problem is, um, is, is this big footprint, but you can actually do a lot of farming, et cetera, within the tower. Um, yeah, so that's also a possibility, but you might have to use a mix and match between these particular towers that you're looking at. Now we're just going to look at an, a, an example line. So we looked at a quad zebra using a guide V tower, standard one. This, this was actually the work that we did for the Camden Duva line many years ago. Um, and uh, we looked at a lot of different options for conductors and towers. So you got a triple bunting, which was not uh, ESCOM standard at the time. The only one really was a was a zebra out of this lot, uh, with a guide V bunting with a cross rope suspension tower, phase spacing 6.5, a rail conductor. The beauty about the cross rope as well was, of course, you can vary the phase spacing without changing the tower window. So you could actually look at different phase spacings. Um, before you made your final decision. Then a rail, bitten, bob link, and burst fit. These are all different kinds of uh, normally three layer conductors of different sizes, different strandings. Um, and then of course, with the different phase spacings. What we did then was we took that the quad zebra would be around about three. And using linear interpolation, we got a particular score that you could then use um, out of 10 uh, for each of the different values. Uh, and these are the actual values. So this would be millions of rand, 
Um, these would be the ratio values. So these have got all different units. Uh, range per MVA would be these two here. Um, but now when you're looking at the scores, there's actually, uh, they actually just a score out of 10 um, and uh, they are unitless. So you can add them together. Then what we did was use um, found that the, the 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 using at the weightings of W1 is LCC, W2 is the uh, is thermal rating, and W3 is the MV, MVA SIL. You find that the you need to actually look at a line which will give you with using various ratings the best option. And these figures here in the uh, in square brackets are the ranking. And interesting to note that the uh, case one, which is the squad zebra that we would use as a standard, came out virtually lost in every single one of these options. In other words, the other options we looked at gave you a far better initial cost to, um, to MVA or thermal rating, as well as the SIL. And the one that came out the best was the option seven, which happened to be the triple burst with an 8.5 meter uh, um, cross rope suspension, which led to the development then of the five to four tower, uh, which was a cross rope suspension tower for triple burst fit. So, looking at the findings and benefits of using this kind of indicator, we found that <laughs> you you're now not designing a line for a particular um, conductor, which, if, for example, the planners in this case would use a quad zebra. Rx and B values to do the load flows. In the past, what you would do is then hand that over to the designers. They would take a quad zebra standard tower, standard design, and just build the line. However, now you're looking at a lot of optimization. So you, your tower foundation hardware and electrical designers have to work together. Your, your, your civil engineers, mechanical engineers, uh, electrical engineers, and planners, and of course, the guys that are experts in Corona, the guys that are experts in um, insulation coordination, insulator design, have to work together to actually, with the planners, to give you this particular design. This is an iterative process. Now, the indicator is very sensitive. It detects errors fairly rapidly. If your if your costs are out or your cost uh, is not in the same um, uh, ratios, in other words, uh, for certain things. Uh, for example, a, a, a guide V tower is sometimes more expensive than a cross rope and sometimes not. You'll find that there's errors coming through very quickly in the indicator. And you can look now at an optimization looking at overall line design. You assume reliability is constant for all options, but that could be taken into account in the next uh, particular area uh, or the next detailed design phase. You need an accurate cost system that's at least accurate between the different options. It doesn't have to be absolutely accurate, it needs to be relatively accurate. And most aspects of design, line design, are taken into account. In conclusions on this, you, your line design options can be objectively determined. The ATI is a guide for which options can be finalized and alignment, it's aligned with planners' requirements. There again, we got uh, uh, Richard. If there are any questions, yeah, or well, I can get onto the DC side and we can take questions at the end of that. I think let's um, continue with the with the presentation. We'll take questions just now. Okay, thank you. Now we're getting on to DC line design. First thing we look at here is the electrical characteristics. And your maximum now, remember the other one was uh, root of L over C. You're now looking really at a volt drop. As a, as a percentage of voltage, uh, sending voltage. So the um, this is a, an equation that they look at for the maximum power that will give you a particular uh, volt drop of 10 or 15 percent uh, for a particular DC resistance. And of course, it depends on your sending in voltage, your length of the line, and the resistance in the conductor in ohms per kilometer. So how do you increase the, 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 the power here? Yeah, well, you can have a shorter line or a decreased resistance. There's not a lot of other things that you can fiddle around with relating to the, the phase spacings, the bundles, et cetera. In fact, with DC lines, your phase spacings don't, your, your poles don't have to be on the same tower. And we know that from the core of Basel line, 
um, the, the the poles are in fact over a kilometer apart. So you've um, you 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 haven't got the same interaction on a DC line as you've got on an AC line in relation to uh, surge impedance loading and things like that, which gives your DC options now quite a bit more uh, variation. Um, in addition, the uh, which we'll get to in the DC resistance, it's not dependent on current because you haven't got this transformer effect. Um, so what it really is dependent on is your conductor geometry, conductivity of material and temperature. So really it, to get to the resistance lower uh, in a, for a DC line, what you need to do is put a bigger conductor up. It doesn't matter what the core is, um, as long as you've got a lot of aluminium or low resistance material that will give you a higher power flow and low, uh, um, uh, a lower resistance. Now looking at the um, issue that we have with, with uh, DC relating to Corona, because this is now obviously where you, ca you can, can't just have one big conductor, you've got to have a bundle depending on the particular um, voltage. And this is really the, an example here of the, um, of, of the uh, uh, surface gradient as a function of the, um, of the radius of the conductor. So you can see which different bundles there are. The EC and the 0.95 EC is your corona inception voltage. You've got to be below that. So if you're running a, for example, a two centimeter conductor at 600 kV, um, you need to then use a, uh, a three or four or a five, but the three is right on the 0.95 EC margin. So it's very difficult then um, to ensure that you're not going to get into Corona. So definitely for any two centimeter, 20 millimeter conductor, you need to have a three or four bundle for a 600 kV surface gradient. And this is, this is um, highlighted in TB38H, which is also free download from EC grade. And it's one of the best um, uh, DC line design or system uh, documents that we have. It takes into account costs of terminal equipment, as well as how to design uh, and determine voltage for DC lines. Now, looking at the corona loss, um, P is a corona loss for, um, sorry, P is a corona loss. Uh, and it's dB above one watt per meter. Emax is a positive polarity, a maximum bundle gradient, and D is a subconductor diameter in centimeters, and N is a number of subconductors. <laughs> and uh, what what we're finding here is that you, um, again, you need to have, it's almost exactly the same as the AC case. So to reduce the corona, you need um, bundles with large number of subconductors, in the particular bundle. Um, and uh, the, the bigger the diameter with the subconductors, the lower the corona loss. Looking at, uh, at um, insulator considerations for DC, it's similar to AC as far as a tower window design is concerned, whether you have a, a, a V and I or whatever. Um, normally on a, on a uh, DC line, you might have two Vs for a bipolar uh, line. Um, for glass insulators, remember that you need to use a germanium and not silicon glass because normal glass will shatter and you also need a zinc collar. Uh, your creepage is a lot larger than for AC um, and your space charge considerations as well as uneven pollution need to be taken into account. And uh, a nice thing about composites is that they can be used for AC and DC and lighter weight often suits um, uh, the, insula, the long insulator insula, installation. Now, overseas, most of the uh, designs use porcelain discs uh, for DC uh, rather than glass. Um, our Cora Vaseline uses glass uh, where we don't have composites, but it's quite a rare occasion uh, because of the special glass that you actually need uh, for DC um, insulators. Just looking then at the summary of options, um, if you decrease your, um, your, your, your pole spacing, 
It's bad for corona, but again, good for mechanical loading. This is on a bipolar line. Voltrop thermal rating is about the same. If you're looking at large aluminium area, it's good for Voltrop, bad for corona, good for mechanical loading, and bad for thermal rating, as again, for the same reasons mentioned for AC. If your bundle diameter increases, it doesn't have any effect on the Voltrop. It's bad for corona, bad for mechanical, and neutral for thermal. So you wouldn't do that for um, DC lines. If you're looking at a bundle design for DC, you would put them just in the limit of uh, subconductor um, uh, um, movement, as I said, about 15 uh, diameters. High steel content, again, um, not really too much of an issue uh, for this. Remember that for DC, you're looking normally at um, at losses as being the, the, the main issue. Um, so your cost of losses are your, are your big issue. So you need to have a lot of aluminium up in the air. Now, this is a graph which is found in TB388. And it's, it, it's extremely useful um, to determine the voltage that you need for a particular megawatt transfer. So, and for, for, um, for a particular distance. So the first, the, the, these three lines, 750 kilometer, 1500 kilometer, and 3000 kilometers. Note that for high voltage DC, the, the trend normally is for very long lines. You, do, you wouldn't use a DC necessarily uh, for um, short lines. And these on the left uh, axis is million US dollars per year. Uh, and then say, for example, you want to transfer 3000 megawatts uh, down 1500 kilometers. It would end up in the green area, which will then give you 600 kV. Uh, if you wish to use um, 4,000 megawatts for 1,500 kilometers, you're then looking at the 800 kV uh, area. And they have in China built an 800 kV DC and they're looking at 1,100 kV DC right now. Uh, any questions on that before I get on to the in indicators? Yeah, let's have a look. Rob, maybe while we're waiting, I, I, I'm, we've just finished a, a line recently, and, and what I found interesting is that sometimes, as planners, the planners are conservative. Um, they assume that your, low, your your line is going to be loaded immediately, and and that sometimes doesn't transpire. You end up with a situation where you initially under light loaded conditions, and you start ending up with this Ferranti effect, double circuits in parallel without anything other than a, necessarily a transformer load. Um, and I think sometimes you've got to be careful from a planning perspective. Um, what we're experiencing in Africa is, is, is that the load projections don't immediately materialize or the domestic loads aren't necessarily swung across immediately. Um, and you could again, end up with all sorts of, of, of issues that, you didn't that weren't built into assum or assumptions that you had made. Um, about the loading that you would experience on those circuits. Now, that's, a, that's exactly why for the for the uh, planner's requirements that you would ask for, you need to have that load forecast. In other words, if they're going to start off low, at no point them telling you you want a thousand megawatt line, but you're only yes. going to get a thousand megawatts at 20, and then it's going to be for one month. Um, you need to know how you're going to build it up and if there's any step changes or whatever expected. Uh, interestingly, the other effect is also important in that um, with generation coming on and freeing up of the market in the UK, they found that the lines when, when loaded went immediately up to, um, to, to full load. Uh, and that gave them a lot of problems relating to, to, to uh, ground clearance because the conductors got too hot being shiny. The shiny conductors um, actually mm. heat higher than the darkened conductor um, and uh, so they all had new conductors on which then uh, overheated the conductors uh, because they went up to 100% load um, and normally it takes at least a few months uh, or a year to get to that load so it's both ways you need to understand exactly what that 
load uh, growth is going to be and then the load profiles uh, relating to that. And then you need to simulate a light load and a heavy load to ensure you don't get that Ferranti effect so that yeah, under light load conditions, you can either then switch a circuit out or you can put a reactor in. Yes. Um, okay, so we have one question here uh, from Sibulela. Why do we still have one DC line in the country uh, and are there any plans for any future uh, HVDC lines, for example, taking, I'm assuming you want power from Inga, yeah? Um, so that, that is the question at the moment. Um, uh, we have we have one, we haven't really needed any others. There are uh, studies afoot to take it from uh, the Madupi area, yes, down to the Cape. Um, and, and then integrate it into the AC system there. Because uh, a DC line will actually take the uh, generation from point A and put it at point B, basically. It's it's a point to point. There's been a lot of work around the Inga and the, the use of multi-terminal DC coming down into the country. The issue there is, of course, that above 3,000 megawatts, it's if we lose that line, um, it, it puts a big bump on the system. So it's, it's, it's quite difficult in fact to commit to take a lot more power that's um perhaps not that uh stable um but uh, the, that that would most probably also be a dc line uh configuration coming there but the the the, the real the real um uh issue is that we haven't really got the got the need for a particular dc uh line at this point that an ac line can't deal with in the next sort of three to five years Okay. Okay, I think that's that's it from the questions. Uh, there was one here. Do we still have demand for DC? I think you've answered that one already in South Africa. Yes, definitely. And, and the DC demand is going to increase. There's no doubt. The terminal terminal uh, equipment is dropping drastically, and the voltage source converters now can go up to over 2,000 megawatts. So the the um, and voltage source converters can then use multi-terminal without a problem. So you're now getting a lot of the AC uh, benefits uh, by using DC, which actually then helps you a lot more because you can control the entire power flow down a DC line using, it's almost a fax device. So the, the, the use of DC, not only on at HV and UHV, but also at MV is going to increase uh, in the next few years for sure. Yes, I'm, I'm very interested in the, in the MV applications. Um, there's another question here. Are there not plans to run a new DC uh, line at 800 kV? That's from Lynn Darney. Um, but I think you might have addressed that already. Um, yeah, depending, you need to look at, at that graph from 388 and see what you want to transmit and for how long. The big cost yes. difference between 600 and 800 kV. And uh, the, if you're only going to transmit 3,000 megawatts for 1,500 kilometers, use a 600. Um, uh, so uh, I would say in our country, yeah, very unlikely we're going to go above 600. Robert, it's just a question from my side. Um, I mean, how easy would it be to do something like take an existing hydrography line, convert that to DC? Um, is, is that a am I? No, oh, absolutely no problem. As long as you can get the line out, you can use it for a. A double, uh, a, a, a double bipole metallic return, uh, and you could, you could, you could configure the phases and that, and you get a lot more power down it. There is a, a brochure out from Seagray on AC to DC conversion, which is also free download, and you can get all the all the all the benefits and technical requirements for that. But it's definitely an option you can look at. I mean, do you know offhand for a similar conductor type what? you would get from a DC as opposed to AC if you kept the conductor the uh, same? It's a two to three times power flow. It's, it's, it's quite substantial. Um, so you can, because you, you yeah, effectively you doubling the capacity. You can double the capacity on, on that and you can get slightly higher voltage depending on the on the tower designs. But, it, but it's, it's substantial. It might be say one and a half to two times, but it, it's pretty so it's definitely an upgrade path. Okay, let's move on. Yep. Um, yeah. Okay, um, I'm going to move on now because I see time is ticking. Yeah, okay. 
Thank you. We're now just getting on to the objective indicator again for DC line design. So the what's the process? Select a voltage, as we said, do we need 600 or 800 here? Determine the range of conductor bundled amateur, number of subconductors, as well as height above ground pole facings that'll meet corona limitations. Determine the range of tower foundation conductor configurations and finalize the most suitable tower foundation bundle option. Then you recheck it with the power flow requirements, converter cost and technology. Because the big thing, of course, with DC is the converter cost that's in the substations. And what we've done here is exactly the same as with the AC, except in this particular one, you're, uh, because the, uh, the, uh, it's, it's not inversely proportional, um, the initial cost is multiplied by the corona loss or um, what we've used as well as the inception gradient, and then the, um, in, the IC over MVA thermal. Just saying, when you look at it, this is an example that we've, we've what we didn't choose the particular voltage. We just said, let's try all three voltages um, for a particular type of uh, line. We're looking at 3000 megawatts for 1750 kilometers. Number of conductors per pole, we try five, four, five, and six. We'd use an ACSR conductor. And uh, these are the losses, cost, the loss factor, life in years. And these equations are all come out of technical brochure 388. We looked in at six different alternates with, these are different uh, bundle the conductors in the bundle. So four, five, and four, a five conductor bundle is not very common, but it is possible. Working on the life cycle cost, initial cost, thermal rating, thermal, and then your thermal, your, your surface gradients. We then worked out the scores, assuming that alternative one, which was 600 kV quad bundle, uh, was our current practice, gave that a score of three. We then worked out the others. And you can see that in some cases, the score goes less than three. In other words, our present practice assumption wasn't too bad. What we did then was we actually just rate, ranked them with various, um, with various uh, weighting factors. And I've just repeated the previous table here so you can see the options. And there we can see the rankings there. There's a rank one, a rank one there, and so on. Now, the one that gave the most was really your option six, because they get a rank two, one, one, four, and the average gave you a rank of rank average of two. Um, and that option six was a six bundle 800 kV uh, line for this particular load. So if you're using 3000 megawatts, 1700 kilometers, you're likely to be far better off for the six bundle 800 kV uh, design. So this, this actually can help you now determine voltage, bundle, et cetera. And the, the beauty about it is that you can do it fairly rapidly on a spreadsheet, just using the uh, equations that are in 388. I think uh, what I'll do, Richard, is, is um, continue to the next section and then take questions. Um, what we've done as well is we've looked at cost of lines. And uh, this was done by uh, people submitting detailed, detailed data of costs that they are, that they have uh, encountered around the world. So the purpose was to compare the work done by working group nine in 1990. And then the questionnaire was in two parts. The first was to compare component costs of existing projects and then costs of an actual line with given parameters. There was a, a quite a poor response. So we're only looking really at 13 respondents um, with various different lines, of course. But there was over 100 in 1990. And the reason for this is mainly competitiveness around uh, the markets, uh, around utilities, not wanting to give too much information away. Um, looking at the at North American projects, these are material costs to construction costs to design costs and land and environmental costs for different designs. DC is double circuit, not DC. They're all AC lines. So this is double circuit, single circuit with a particular type and the length and the uh, particular kilometers. And you can see the breakdown, the percentage breakdown in line costs. So what you can see here is your construction costs 
in quite a lot of lines are very high compared to the material costs. And that's quite important for later on. If you're looking at Europe, you'll find that some of these uh, costs again, construction costs quite high, but material costs also high in some areas. So there you've got a 400 kV one and one 10 kV triple finch duck 50 kilometers, and you can see that the material costs here are very high. You also find that they use some rather narrow towers and rather specialized towers, which gives you very high material costs. <laughs> and and uh, so you can see that this varies uh, right through the different the different projects. Looking at the line costs for Africa, you see that the construction costs are generally lower, even if you're looking at a double circuit line, six turn and quad turn, um, you'll find that the material costs, in fact, are quite a high uh, cost compared to the total cost of the line. So in other words, your construction costs here, this is normally due to the fact that we have uh, most of our uh, line 765-400 are built not in, in non-urban areas, whereas in Europe it's built in fairly built up areas. The, the labor cost is very high in Europe and North America compared to here. Um, so this is why you're starting to get the construction cost being slightly lower and our material costs might be slightly higher. If you're now looking at Asia, and this is mainly China, there again you see the material costs now hitting 70%, over 60%, construction costs low. And this is a cost per kilometer now. So now bear in mind that in these costs here, your, your, your uh, material cost for North America was, uh, was, was fairly um, low compared to construction costs. Here it was a sort of a mix. Here it was mainly uh, your material was higher than construction and here your materials are very much higher than construction. Now each of these lines, don't worry about the figures on the side, each line is the same for each of these. So you can see that the difference in costs around um, in, in North America running at one, two, three, four, uh, nearly four to five lines, whereas here we don't hit more than two, one and a half. And for Asia, they're under one. Um, which uh, indicates that your line costs here is 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 uh, less than half of what it is in these uh, in North America projects really on average, um, and and that's what we found right throughout. You can see this one particular one here is an outlier. This is an environmentally friendly, low impact line design pole design called the Wintract in the Netherlands, and this is extremely high. Uh, cost, per, cost per kilometer. Um, so environmental friendly lines in fact tend to, well, perception of pole lines that are designed specifically uh, for aesthetics uh, cost you quite a lot. So from the graphs, if the conductor cost as a percentage of total line costs is greater than 10%, the cost is likely to be relatively low. So what we did in the in actual brochure, you can get all the details. But really what you're looking at here is if you take your, what is your conductor cost? And is a is the conductor cost uh, greater than 10% of the total line cost? If so, you can be fairly happy with the overall cost of the line. The range of percentages examples received conductor cost for relatively low cost per kilometer should vary between 10 and 15%. So if you can say get a, a, a line which has got so many millions per kilometer, um, and they say, well, is that line um, a good value for money? And you can work out the ratio of the conductor to the total cost, and it's say 20%, you can say, well, yes, it's actually a very good line design. If it comes in at 5%, you say, well, maybe we should relook really at some things because something's not right here. The, con the construction cost is too high or the foundation costs are too high. So in the previous survey, it found conductor cost was around 32% of material cost, which was 63%. That results in 20% of the total line cost. So in other words, if your conductor was 20% in 1990, it was a good line. Now that's dropped to around 15, between 10 and 15. So it could be concluded the cost per kilometer has increased from 1990 to 2014 in real terms. And this is really due to labor and environmental issues. 
So a good target for competitive costs would be that the conductor cost should be between 15 and 20 percent. And this brochure was written in 2014. So these costs have got there, but we haven't really had a lot of changes in the environment uh, around that time. So I would say this is still a, a relatively good benchmark. And these are really your the details, which I won't go into, but it is in the brochure that you can actually look at the percentage of as a function of material costs. And these are the comparisons compared to, to 1991. Uh, 1991 and in 2013, the material costs as percentages. If we can just get then to the summary of the trends, material and construction costs are, tends to be the material cost is reduced as a function of total cost, with construction costs being more, pre more prevalent. And that's the entire range of lines. So basically we're finding to build the line itself, construction costs has gone up as a, a higher rate than material costs. Conductors, uh, this, the shield wires included in the conductor costs in 2013, even with the inclusion of conductor costs, generally the same or lower percentage of the total cost. The shield wire, cost is related to OPGW for 2013 and steel wire for 1991. Of course, they didn't use too many OPGW in 1991. So the, um, the sample is quite small, but it does indicate a similar percentage to the 1991 costs. Insulators, the insulators are slightly lower, and the reason for that is that the composite insulator prices dropped considerably, far lower than the uh, glass and, and porcelain costs. So in the past, we were using glass instead of composite, because composite was quite expensive. The glass price hasn't dropped that much but the composite price has dropped and there's been a lot more uh, players in the market for composite insulators. Then the towers were higher than 1991 and that includes erection costs, which could include the higher cost of labor reflected in the construction and normally compared to material cost. And then the big thing here is environmental constraints and using more narrow base towers, uh, more aesthetically appeasing poles and things like that, which are coming in, which increasing the tower costs. Then the foundations, the total cost spent foundations is lower. And uh, the working group felt that this was due to higher mechanization and the use of more pile foundations um, that, that we used uh, in, in the past. Whereas a, in the past, they used more pad and chimney foundations, not piles. Piles are more uh, uh, efficient uh, relating to uh, extraction of material and so on. So that's really the, the summary yeah, of course. So the, the 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 big thing there is to remember, if your total uh, conductor cost is 10 to 15 percent of the total cost of the line, you most probably got a reasonable line. Just looking here, and this is also con, uh, a complements of Eskim, looking at uh, different tower designs. This is with an existing guide V, and this is the tower which I indicated with the um, uh, negative shielding angle. Uh, this tower is, uh, is, has problems in relating to live line work because of the floating uh, neutral point here. Um, but as a configuration, it's actually quite a, quite a, a, a good tower from an electrical uh, and mechanical point of view. Just looking then at what can be done with cost savings, and interesting to note, the US don't like to use any guys um, uh, for, for various reasons. Uh, but if you look at the benefit of the guy, you can see there for angles for for angle structures that you um, actually get a far lower uh, overall cost, and you can see the components on the right. So you get a 52% saving there. And if you're looking at a 15 to 30 degree angle structure, um, you actually get a 46% saving. And uh, these designs were taken as a base from Canada, which use extensive uh, guy structures, but just south of the border, they don't use, they only use self-supporting. And uh, Europe also actually favor self-supporting towers uh, relating to guide structures. So this is just an example of how you can optimize certain tower designs to get some savings. And this is the uh, test for that particular tower at Netfa. And um, these are just the acknowledgements uh, for this particular uh, presentation. I'd like to include Seagray uh, and, and, and also the Eskim Line Engineering uh, Department uh, for this. Um, uh, Richard, that's the uh, end of the
presentation is uh, we can then stop there and uh, take any more questions if there are. Uh, thank you very much, <clears throat> Dr. Stephen. Yes, um, let's see if there are any more questions coming through. Uh, I'm just going to give you give the audience a chance. Um, there is a question here from um, Pierre Sattar. Do you think the uptake of the use of ACCC conductors and higher performance conductors will be considered by ESKIM as a standard in the near future, considering that they typically have standardized on ACSR? Um, I, I, I knew, you might probably need to ask uh, ESKIM that um, at this point. My, my, my opinion is uh, I can talk uh, more or less generally, but the ACCC, remember, is a special conductor. It's a, a it's a registered trademark, ACCC, carbon cord uh, conductor. It's a single core. Um, I'd rather look at, if you, if you take the question to say, are we looking at, um, at polymer cord? In other words, stranded polymer cores or FRP uh, type core conductors. Yes, there, there, there are um, applications, um, but the, uh, it, it's mainly in, in, in the line of, of very specialized upgrading or where you need a low knee point and a fairly low, um, hello, uh, a, a fairly low uh, um, uh, 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 tension in the in the in the particular conductor. So it would be it would be very specialized applications um, that you would that you would actually consider using um, a, 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 a an C or, or polymer cord. I'd, I I. I it might be considered as a as a as a standard going forward, but which one I'm um, um, I'm not too sure. Uh, there are others such as ACSS, which I would also definitely look at, especially on new lines. Um, if you're looking instead of uh, using a, um, a polymer core uh, conductor uh, on a new line, uh, it might actually be cheaper and more cost effective to use an ACSS conductor. At the moment, uh, Dr. Stephen, we don't have any more questions. Right. Um, what I would like to do is, is hand over to the chairman of the um, KZN branch to close the session. Thanks, Richard. Thank you. And that brings us to the end of an interesting, informative, and very detailed presentation on lines. Our special thanks goes to Dr. Rob Stephen for an excellent job. I'd also like to place on record our appreciation to the SAIEE for arranging the webinar platform, to Richard Aslager for assisting with the setup of the webinar, and to all our attendees. I also urge you to become uh, members of this institute. For that, you may visit the SAIWE website. And yeah, uh, thanks very much for, the, for attending today's talk. For upcoming webinars, you are more than welcome to visit the SAIWE website, and we shall meet again. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>